Hello, everybody. My name is Jimmy Smith, and welcome to the Wine with Jimmy channel. Uh, this is a section on cherry. We're looking at the first part of um, eight or nine uh, presentations on sherry for the WSET level four diploma. So this is suited for those of you that are tackling the arduous challenge of the level four diploma. As you know, quite a big step up from the level three. Um, so in this one, we'll just be talking about the history and we will go through all the key facts that you are required to know about the history and I'll throw in a few extras uh, to make it flow a little better as well. Um, this is going to be free content available on the YouTube channel Wine with Jimmy. Uh, but if you um, want to have a look at our online portal, we have access to lots more information and, and data, and that's on the winewithjimmy.com website, uh, which will give you many, many helping hands to um, gaining more confidence and uh, really sort of tackling the world of the diploma a bit more easily. So um, let's have a look at the history. Um, in the level four presentations that we are showing now, we won't do questions at the end of each section. They're actually be at the end of the unit. So we're going to be looking at them at the end of the Sherry unit. They will only be available via the um, online portal. Okay, so uh, Sherry, the wonderful region of Sherry, which is, of course, down in South Spain. So this is about the history, not the geography yet, but I do, I do want to just outline for you um, where we're looking at, just so it gives you a bit of an idea. There's a lovely picture of a sherry bodega with its wonderfully high roofs and open top to allow the circulation that we talked about on another section. So here we are. So this is... Um, uh, Andalusia down in South Spain. So it is that region which I, has I have highlighted in green down at the bottom. So stretching really from, and I'll get my pointer here so you can see this, um, from around the Portuguese border here on the western side um, to Extremadura, Castilla La Mancha on its northern border, and then down to Murcia. Um, so just near around Murcia, the city and Alicante on its eastern side, and of course then the Mediterranean and the Atlantic on its southern and southwestern section. Uh, so it is down here in that southern area. Andalusia is the region, and Jerez, which is this orange area down here around the Bay of Cadiz, is actually one of the wine regions of Andalusia. So let's talk a bit about the naming of Andalusia. Let's talk a bit about the foundations of it, because it is the history section. So let's have a look. So first of all, um, what we have in the region is, uh, in terms of establishing a bit of wine, is the Phoenicians. So the Phoenicians were, were a wonderful people who um, traveled all the way from um, Asia Minor, from around to today, what we call Lebanon and they were a maritime nation. They were very expert traders, and we know that because we have found evidence of Phoenician trading across all of the Mediterranean. Uh, so we have um, data from areas like Crete, a lot of Greek islands, a lot of the Greek mainland, Italy, southern France, Provence, uh, Marcella, for instance, Spain, of course, North Africa, and the list goes on. So in our area, which of course is southern Spain, the Phoenicians here, which is on this map, which is I, I find quite useful, is the purple arrows, which is actually quite an important color for the Phoenicians who traded in purple dye. It's very famous, the Phoenician name actually comes from that. Uh, they traded heavily in this dye and it was very well loved across the Greek civilizations and eventually the Roman civilizations. So it's quite useful to actually do the arrows uh, on the map in purple. And you can see their extent, their movement here. Um, it sort of is around Ibiza, going into sort of Catania Nova, uh, and that's around Murcia today, but then mainly this southern section, of course, today, what we call Andalusia, establishing places like uh, Malacca, uh, which today is Malaga, down here, and uh, Gades, uh, today, which is Cadiz, which is down in that southwestern part. Um, so the Phoenicians is very important uh, for that early, early um, trade. 
Um, the Phoenicians, as I mentioned, were um, very good at traders uh, trading. Um, we have wine presses that have been found in Andalusia, uh, in uh, Gadir or Cadiz, uh, and it's thought to actually be some of the oldest standing um, wine presses that we have in Western Europe. In Eastern Europe, of course, there's a huge amount of claims around the areas like Georgia, Armenia, Turkey, Mesopotamia. But in Western, um, because of the Phoenician link who learnt a lot of their viticultural know-how from Mesopotamia, then they brought it across here. Uh, so really important area with an extensive history around 1100 BC. We have the Greeks traveling here um, and that's the bluish influence uh, up here in the kind of northwesterly area, uh, uh, sorry, the northeasterly area and the easterly, easterly area. So today, what we call Catalonia and Valencia, establishing places like Taraco, Taracanesis, uh, and down towards Alicante. So this was a bit of influence from the from the Greeks. Now, I've not bolded this because it is not mentioned in the diploma texts, but I wanted to just give you an idea that the Greeks did have an influence in this area as well. Um, then we have Carthaginians, so not bolded again, but Carthaginians, uh, which came up from North Africa, of course, very important, really at uh, battling the might of the Roman Empire and the Romans around the same time. There were a couple of theatres of war, uh, which really were between Carthage and Rome. One of them was Sicily, uh, really, which was a, a staging point for the battles, the Punic Wars between Carthage and Rome. But in Spain as well, um, the Carthaginians and the Romans fought very early on. They signed the Treaty of Ebro, which is the Ebro River, which comes down from northern Spain, that is uh, the um, Cantabrian mountain range, and empties into the Mediterranean north of Valencia. Um, they signed this treaty, the Romans were to stay north of the Ebro and the Carthaginians were to stay south. It lasted a while, but the Romans got a bit itchy feet and they decided to start to conquer and they did conquer Carthage uh, within Spain eventually. Um, the Roman Empire, which then dominated the peninsula, the Spanish peninsula, lasted for quite some time, but the Roman Empire in its Western form collapsed in 476 AD. Uh, and of course, having such a civilization giving stability for such a long time meant that this really led to a collapse of civilizations across the whole of Western Europe, including places going into Germania, so Saxony, uh, places like, uh, of course, Gaul, Britannia, Hispania, and the list goes on. Um, we have two um, factions. We have the Vandals and the Visigoths. There are many others, like the Ostrogoths as well, uh, who started to really vie for the attention of Spain. So the Vandals, uh, who ended up traveling down through Africa, um, and the name that was where the Vandal uh, comes from, Visigoths were a very civilized peoples, which were civilized really through the Romans, um, but they see their power in southern France in Toulouse before moving into Toledo in Spain and actually governing most of the Spanish peninsula, including Andalusia. They were actually quite peaceful and actually quite forward and innovative. Um, they actually demilitarized their nation because they, they really felt there was no threat. Unfortunately, that was not a great idea. So the Visigoths actually provided some, some stability within the peninsula. The uh, threat that I mentioned was the Moors, and the Moors in 711 AD, which is mentioned in your text, so it is exceedingly important for you to know it, um, the Moorish rule um, really lasted from 711, and they quickly dominated the I uh, Iberian Peninsula. Really, it, within about 10, 15 years, they had conquered most of the Iberian Peninsula. They even went uh, a far, a farther north into, uh, into France. Um, there are some parts of Spain they did not conquer, such as Galicia, Asturias in the north. They attempted to, but failed. But they really did dominate the peninsula. Um, the Reconquista of the Christian Kingdom really started in the north around Galicia, 
and Asturias and started to push the Moors back over many years. But really the Moors had very big influence in the 8th century, 9th century and 10th century, and then diminishing influences in the 11th, 12th and 13th centuries. And that's because of the re-emergence of the Christian ki ki kingdom, the Reconquista. Um, the Moors being Islamic, uh, did not permit the consumption of alcohol. I think they turned a blind eye quite a lot. Certainly, a lot of the um, a lot of the the people stationed within um, uh, Spain for the Moors actually started to drink a bit, even if they were Moorish. Um, but really, production of wine was stifled under the Moorish rule. So there's very little produced during uh, during this time. Um, so vineyards uh, continued, but really by the end of the 10th century around two-thirds of the vineyards had been grubbed up so they were eliminated because they were not needed. Uh, grapes were still produced for things like raisins, uh, certainly for consumption uh, under the Moorish rule. Um, and that leads us to the Reconquista. So we have um, the Christian kingdom. So Jerez, uh, that is Jerez de la Frontera, the main town and that's actually one important thing to mention immediately um i'm not going to scribble that down for you so let's just do that now let's pop this uh, here let me get my pen here let's do this in red uh so let's pop this here um Jerez de la frontera so let's take that name Jerez is in the name of the town or what cherry takes its name from of the frontier so de la frontera of the frontier, meaning a frontier settlement. They call it a frontier settlement, really, because this was a, a, a battleground between the Reconquista Christians and the, the Moors. And there are, are quite a few other de la fronteras down in the south of Andalusia as well. Um, so Jerez de la Frontera eventually came under Christian rule in the 13th century. And by the end of the 15th century, um, the Moors were finally defeated and pushed out of the Iberian Peninsula uh, with the Battle of Granada. And finally, Spain entered its golden age where its homeland was secure and then they could expand. Uh, so this is the formation, of course, of the Spanish kingdom. Um, so we have, of course, the more modern history that we will need to have a little bit of a look at. And, and really what we should mention before we do is that um, with this stability under Christianity and the Spanish kingdom, um, domestic consumption and exports grew exponentially as English, Flemish, Irish, Scottish traders began to ship the wines. A Scottish trader, uh, you may know, a very famous one, is Gonzales Bias. The Bias part comes from William Bias, who was a Scotsman. Um, so the wines further benefited from free trade agreements in this area, uh, certainly between France and England. Uh, and then you have the expansion of the Spanish kingdom and the empire from this land. We have um, Christopher Columbus, who set sail from Andalusia. Magellan also set sail, sail from, um, uh, from this area as well. Uh, you have Magellan going towards the Indias uh, and the Spice Route, and of course, Christopher Columbus going towards the New World to places like Haiti uh, and all the islands within the Caribbean, that sort of zone. Uh, so the wines would, of course, travel at that point as well. Large volumes of sherry were shipped to America, uh, and um, really, this was a time of uh, great expansion. But there was a bit of a difficulty within the island itself. There was the Peninsula Wars, of course, Portugal claiming it, its independence. And later on, things like Phylloxera, which devastated the industry, as it did many others. Um, but in between these uh, extreme parts in the history, um, sherry did boom. So it's a bit of an up and down industry, the, uh, the sherry industry. OK, so that's the, um, the, um, the, the final part of that kind of uh, older or early history. Um, Sherry's popularity grew in the 19th century and 20th century. Um, so uh, this is due to really its brilliant links to empires such as the Dutch, uh, to the English, to the French, 
uh, and of course Spain and the Portuguese. So the wines were ending all over the big empires of the world. Um, but the production started to really ramp up. And in fact, other countries in the world wanted to emulate the success of sherry. Uh, so other sherries were being produced around the world. So in 1933, Spain's first wine regulated council was formed, the Consejo Regulador. Uh, and this was the first within Spain. And this was to protect of course, the sherry production, setting regulations uh, on the production and trading of sherry wines. Okay, great. So, um, so that's a very important uh, point in time. Um, now, of course, that's 1933 when the first wine regulated council was formed. Um, very much uh, the civil war. Uh, within Spain and following that and then of course the Second World War and there was a significant decline during this time as one would expect. Um, so they fell um, but they recovered the um, production and the sales recovered. Uh, sherry sales really reached their peak, to, peak in the 1970s uh, and in 1979 was the big big year, uh, the big big surplus year. But, of course, and we'll talk about this in part two in wine laws and business, um, Sherry then had to compete with the emerging success of the New World and other styles of wines. Um, so being a very traditional style Sherry, it then suddenly had the might and the diversity of the world to contend with. And these are other fortified wines, but also just other generic light wines of the world. Younger generations were um, considering and exploring with these different styles of wine. So um, we, um, we are going to look at uh, the, the rebound. So I've actually just mentioned this, a rebound in the 1670s, fall in demand in recent times, as I've just, uh, as I've just mentioned uh, as well. So sorry, I haven't actually flicked the screen along there we go um so yes rebound in the 60s and 70s and certainly the end of the 70s the most sort of famous uh, production amount and then fall in demand in those recent times now we can't finish talking about the history of a sherry without really talking about ramus uh, ramusa uh, so rumaza sorry and then the harveys of bristol so uh, Rumazza started um, really as a sherry blender, what's called an almanzanista, uh, and they would blend the sherries together, you know, buying in a huge amount of produce um, to suit demand and blending, aging and blending those sherries together. Um, so this uh, began the company called Rumazza. Um, and they um, started to ship their own sherry in the 1950s, and they started a relationship with uh, Harvey's of Bristol. Um, and they gained the um, exclusive contract with Harvey's of Bristol, uh, being the major supplier for their Bristol cream, and that's the oldest bottle there on the right-hand side that I could find as a picture. Uh, and in fact, it was something like a 99 year contract, which was uh, ended uh, earlier than it, uh, it, it didn't play out. But it was a, a 99 year contract to supply Harvey's Bristol cream. And it became the most popular style that was produced uh, for the UK market. So it dominated in the 1970s. Uh, and they it really gave Rumaza a um, huge amount of money. They in fact expanded their portfolio across things like um, uh, uh, real estate. Uh, they also had um, things like banking, hotels, all those kind of things. Um, they really had to clamber for grapes and production to really make. Uh, and settle the demand. So Rumasa became a huge mass producer uh, and it was negatively impacting the sherry industry for many decades. In fact, in 1983, the government nationalized Rumusa and um, they did that because they claimed that they hadn't paid millions of, of, uh, of unpaid taxes. 
Uh, so um, that was very uh, difficult around that time. Um, it caused uh, you know, unemployment, social unrest, and a large number of the bodegas closed or were sold and merged during these times because they were unable to sustain themselves due to the damaging effects of this mass production. Um, so this was a difficult time. And of course, many of you who are in quite traditional markets, such as the United Kingdom, will have experienced the Bristol cream phenomenon. It may be through uh, maybe grandparents or great grandparents or whatever, uh, but it certainly is, an, is a wine, a fortified wine of the older or yesteryear. Um, and you know, it's Harvey's choicest old full pale sherry Bristol cream. Uh, we'll talk about the style of sweetened. It is a sweetened sherry. And we'll talk about that style as we go through the presentations on sweetened sherries later on down the line. So, um, so yes, I mean, I, I was first introduced to it uh, by my, um, my grandmother. Uh, and uh, I can't tell you the age I was when I was introduced to it, but... Uh, I don't want that across the internet, but it shouldn't have happened. And But it put a very negative uh, thought about the sherry industry in my mind. And I really stayed clear of sherry due to that. It became a real sort of uh, a problem for me until I visited the region and, of course, understood that sherry is a diverse product and excellent uh, for gastronomical reasons, as well as just, just darn delicious. Um, so, uh, so, yes, it, there's many negative connotations due to this uh, big production of Harvey's Bristol cream which still has ramifications today so uh, it's something certainly that uh, Sherry is trying to shake off its uh, um, um, its image to really then appeal to the younger generation um, we will talk more about the effects of sales and in fact the sales within the domestic market and exports um, on the next presentation and that next presentation is on the wine laws so we will go through a few of the um the key things around the wine laws but then the business the sales um so that will be out next week uh, so you can uh, enjoy that so thank you so much for your time and attention on the history of sherry i do hope you have um learned something and it's uh, helping you for your very um, challenging task in tackling the might of the WSET level four diploma. Um, as ever, if you have any concerns or comments or questions, please get in touch. Um, I'd love to hear from you. You can pop a question or a comment in the section below this video on YouTube if you wish, or you can get in touch with us. Uh, you, we have many social media contacts, so the top of the list there is my own across Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. That's at Wine with Jimmy. Um, you'll find lots of more information there as well. Um, but the best thing you really can do is subscribe on the YouTube channel, so it actually gives you regular updates about the videos that are coming out. Um, so you get an email about that each time. Otherwise, please do check the social media accounts. I am the owner, of course, of West London Wine School, which many of you will know, South London Wine School as well, both in London in the United Kingdom, with West London being the award-winning WSET Educator of the Year 2018. I also own a wine bar, so I'm a wine buyer, that's Stretton Wine House. Uh, and if you do have anything to say on social media, please use the hashtag WLWSVirtual. So thank you so much for your time and attention. I've been Jimmy Smith, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.